Well, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Corey, as she said. Uh, I live in Delaware uh, with my wife, Megan, and our daughter, Mara. She's uh, not quite two years old, so not quite ready for public schools. But uh, we'll get there soon. And in my private life, I'm uh, an attorney. I do mostly tax work these days. And while I'm mostly interested in hearing uh, ideas from people who are in schools every day, who have their kids in their schools now, and folks like you who are interested in the community, uh, when you come to things like these, uh, you often want to hear what ideas us candidates have. Uh, and as far as education goes, when I was in law school, I my uh, school paper that you do, I, I did a paper on uh, how we might be able to solve the statewide school funding crisis. And I suggested that if, uh, because 60% of Ohio's land pretty much is not taxed or valued at its highest and best use value, <coughs> our paper suggested that if we switch to a system of uh, statewide highest and best use value for all land and share that revenue with school districts, uh, we ought to be able to uh, distribute that fund, those funds based on the cost of educating a child and while also seeing lower average tax rates for homeowners and businesses across the state. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Brian? Sure, thank you. I'm a regular volunteer at Olentangy Schools, visiting the classrooms to speak about government. You'll see me at 5Ks, Roots Programs, Enrichment Days, One Community, and the Olentangy Foundation. I've also served on the Olentangy Facilities Committee. In addition, I'm a volunteer swim official, a coach, a member of the Knights of Columbus, and a member of St. Joan of Arc. I am a husband to my wife, Sue, for 18 years, but all of this pales in comparison to my most important job. I am the father to four wonderful children. I'm a father who is grieved at the losses our community and our nation have suffered this year. I'm a father who puts our children on the school bus every morning, expecting them to arrive back every afternoon safely. I'm a father raising a son with autism who chooses to send him to Olentangy schools because of the commitment of the professionals hired in this district. I'm a father who believes in school choice, when that choice is good. I know education is not one size fits all, and this is a strength we have in Olentangy. We have school choice within our district. The Delaware Career Center, children can go to the STEM, the Oasis, traditional high school, or even Columbus State. This is why we choose Olin Community. I'm a father deeply concerned with our state formula for funding our schools. Olin Tangy only gets $559 per student from the state. We are nearing a tipping point from where we may never come back. If we continue down this road, Olin Tangy residents can expect to see an operating levy approximately every three years. This cannot happen. We cannot afford this and we need to fix this. I am a father with four children caught in the Common Core vortex. Four children who took the PARC test. I have seen the pressure on the teachers to teach to the test, not to the student. I have seen the pressure it puts on the child. For over a year now, I've been meeting with our school board members, teachers, parents, and the superintendent to take a deep dive into our core issues. I am the only candidate in this race that is fully invested in OLTNG schools, who is endorsed by Superintendent Margrave, and who plans to make equity for our district and Delaware County a top priority. I've met or reached out with every superintendent in the 67th district who are facing similar issues, and I have pledged the same to them. I am a father who believes that education starts at home with core values, good parenting, and stable families. I believe there are three key societal members who can make a difference in the lives of young people. The mother, the father, and the teacher. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Denise Martin. I am the endorsed Republican candidate for the 67th District House seat. 
Uh, to tell you a little bit about me, I'm a graduate of Mount Juliet High School. I received my bachelor's degree from The Ohio State University and my law degree from Capital University Law School. Presently, I sit as the court administrator in the Domestic Relations Division of the Delaware County Court of Common Pleas. Uh, before that, I prosecuted for eight years uh, up in Marion County. I prosecuted everything from murders to misdemeanors, and uh, my primary focus was domestic violence, and uh, I worked with our drug task force as their primary liaison and prosecutor for higher end uh, trafficking and uh, possession cases. I sit on the Delaware County um, Board of Trustees for the Delaware County District Library. I am the proud mother of two daughters. Uh, my oldest daughter is 21 and a student at The Ohio State University. My youngest daughter, in just uh, three short months, will be graduating from Hayes High School. I'm proud of the education my daughters received, and I believe that it sets them uh, within the Delaware County uh, just, you know, public schools and I believe that it's setting them up for a good post-secondary education. Um, as your next state representative, I'm going to fight for schools because I know that they are vibrant to, that they're essential to a vibrant community. Since the DeRolf decision, which I've had the opportunity to read, I know that our legislature has struggled to um, have a fair funding uh, formula for our schools. We also um, have unnecessary and overburdened or a really burdensome testing, and I'm going to fight with others to get rid of those and the number of days that we spend testing our children. So strong schools aren't just uh, essential to a vibrant community, but they're necessary to the future success of our state, our county, and our country. I am not a career politician. I stand or sit really before you as, um, as a mother and, um, and a citizen of the 67th District who believes that you and I both deserve an accessible representative in the State House to uh, fight for the, the causes that are important to us. As an attorney of 18 years, I know how to work with others, but I know how to fight when it's time to fight, and I'll do that for you. I'll make you this promise that as your next state representative, I will be accessible to you, and I will be accountable to you. As my last daughter goes off to college, this is a commitment I make to you wholeheartedly and without constraints on my time. I appreciate your support. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rick Garfania. I am the state representative for the 68th House District. So I think I'm the only state official here this evening. But I want to thank Polly and, and Julie and Superintendent Rape and everyone else who organized this. I was here two years ago for this event. And I appreciate the opportunity to come back. Um, I live in Genoa Township. I'm uh, so I guess just to back up. So the 68th House District is the eastern half of Delaware County, and then it's all Knox County as well. So two very different dynamics at play. Uh, I live in the, the southern portion of the district, the Genoa Township, and uh, I've been married for 17 years. Uh, my wife Jill uh, is actually a former educator, and I have a daughter, uh, Isabella, who is uh, in sixth grade. She's 11, going on 40. I like to joke, uh, but. Um, we're very happy where we are. Uh, it's been quite an interesting 14 months. I'm a freshman legislator, and uh, I was very fortunate. I was able to get five bills passed out of the Ohio House that I'm extremely proud of. Three of them I got on the governor's desk. So uh, for a freshman legislator, that's a scorecard I'm proud of. And as I like to brag, they're not road naming bills either. I think they got a little bit of teeth to them, um, dealing with issues such as mental illness, uh, public pension reform, uh, something near to me, which is uh, uh, getting broadband to unserved households throughout the state of Ohio, which is a big problem. But I was also able to get a couple of education bills passed, and I'll quickly touch on those. Uh, one was uh, House Bill 124. That was the Delaware Area Career Center bill. For those that don't know, uh, there was a big snafu where the Delaware Area Career Center passed their operating levy, and uh, it passed by 10,000 votes here in Delaware County. Unfortunately, the Board of Elections failed to put it on the ballot and some of the surrounding counties where there's some spillover uh, into in, in those areas. So we weren't able to, pro or the, the, the tax commissioner was not able to process the results of, the, of that levy. So the, the career center was forced with having to possibly invalidate the gains of Delaware County and go back to, I gotta keep coming up, okay. <laughs> Anyways, we got them over the hump. Uh, we were able to preserve the results in Delaware County, put them back on the ballot, rescue the, the career center. They're, they're consolidating facilities. It's a great story to tell. 
I had another bill that we got on the governor's desk dealing with computer science, getting more advanced computer science classes in K through 12. Uh, it is not a mandate. I was very adamant about it. We put language in there avoiding that. Uh, and it's also going to uh, allow our students to have take advanced computer science classes like coding, app development, um, web design, and have those applied to their graduation requirements. Try to prepare our kids for 21st century workforce. Uh, finally, I have a bill, and we got that on governor's desk too. Uh, another bill I'm working on deals with STEM. Um, we, we are top 10 in the country for college debt, uh, but we're also kind of an emerging uh, technology state. Uh, three are, are Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati are top 15 for tech jobs. So what we want to do is make sure that kids that are studying STEM here in the state and, and are going to work in STEM fields, let's work to maybe offset some of their college debt. So I'm teaming up with a Democrat from Ashtabula County, uh, John Patterson, and we've got a STEM bill account cut off. Uh, anyways, look forward to chatting much later, but um, it's been a good year. Thank you. It's been a very, it's been a, a true privilege to represent um, uh, Delaware County. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathleen Tate for 68. And uh, I live in Apple Valley, which is in Knox County. So I have a larger section where I am over there, but I, I don't know as much about this area uh, of, the, of the District 68. I'm an advocate, not a politician. I have seen rights that were gained during my younger life, and believe me, I've had a long life. I am retired, and anyway, those rights have been eroded by self-serving politicians who do not represent the people. I'm running because I want to serve the people. I want to show that a representative can be responsible to the people without having moneyed interests paying me. I know how to listen and fight for those who don't, who cannot or will not stand up for their rights. If I don't know an answer or a solution to a problem, I will find it or let the people know why I couldn't. I believe my background in the Air Force, I was a medical technician many years ago, uh, and in the business world as a computer software and tech support engineer, and as a volunteer in a community. And I believe that those will benefit me in helping the people of Ohio. Now, one of the other things is that I did some research this weekend, and I'm mad as hell. I am mad as hell because of the state budget and education. The state budget says for fiscal year 18 and 19, they are going to have 10.51 billion in, in 2018 and 10.62 billion in, uh, billion in fiscal year 2019. That's a 1% increase yet the inflation rate is over two percent what does that mean we're not getting an increase of one percent we're getting a decrease of one percent and i believe that we need to do a lot of working within the legislature and it's going to start actually at the ground grassroots level we are going to have to take a look at what we want to do with this country, what we want to pay for. We have a lot of problems. We have the opioid crisis. We have the safety in the schools. We have students and the uh, facilities. We need to have those facilities maintained, and we don't have the money. We're going to have to go after a lot of the uh, fluff, and maybe not even so much fluff, in the budget. Anyway. If you want to know more, ask questions, <laughs> and I will stop right there. My name is Joel Spitzer, and um, I'm not mad at anybody. Uh, <laughs> the uh, I'm running for Senate Bill or Senate District 19, which covers all of Delaware County, all of Knox County, and there's a small little tail that runs down into Franklin County. Um, I have a wife, Allison. Uh, we've been married since 2005. She's a teacher at Arrowhead Elementary here in Olentangy. I have four children, uh, three of, one of them attends, Kennedy attends Shanahan, Stella and Camden attend Glen Oak, uh, and Liam, whose four is not in school yet, he'll start kindergarten this fall. Um, I am a practicing attorney with three offices, one in Powell, one in Marion, one in Bucyrus, where I grew up, <coughs> and um, I am a 12-year Air Force veteran, uh, having been deployed twice, uh, and military and wartime. 
I'm also a PhD candidate in school finance, uh, and I hope to finish that this year. Uh, I think all of us have touched on one of the critical and important issues in Ohio, which is our school funding. We've got inner city and rural districts uh, who need more funding. We've got suburban districts like we have here in Delaware County and Knox County that need more money but also need tax relief. Uh, we've got statewide staffing expenses for teachers and other support staff uh, that are outpacing inflation. Uh, and it's just simply not sustainable. Um, one of the things I've touched on routinely uh, during my time campaigning is that we've got this issue with ECOT uh, that unfortunately has cost the state a considerable amount of money and that has trickled down to costing districts money like Olentangy who could have otherwise had that funding that went uh, to fund private interest groups uh, that support charter schools. Um, I too, uh, like the candidate in the 67th, uh, have looked during my PhD candidacy at the highest and best value in land as a fix, but also, um, I got the one minute, to um, include a inside village that would increase with that highest and fair value. Uh, not only is funding at a critical juncture, but also our local control of our education is at stake here with this new uh, conglomerate of House Bill, I think it's 512, that's gonna do away with our State Board of Education, the power that they have. Um, as a, also a critical issue is school safety that I think we all would agree is important to address. And as a father uh, who, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that, I'm also a teacher. I was a teacher for 12 years and a high school administrator prior to becoming an attorney. Uh, so I think I'm in the best situation and best fit to address our educational needs. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, thank you guys for hosting this tonight, this is great. Uh, my name is Louise Valentine, I am the Democratic candidate for State Senate District 19. I live in Genoa Township with my husband, my two kids. Uh, I have twin boys, Anthony and Nicholas, they're five, they just started kindergarten. And uh, my boys are in kindergarten at Alcott Elementary, like Rick Carvania. I am also in Genoa Township and they go to Westville Public Schools. And with them starting school, it kind of got me thinking about how much public schools have helped shape me into the person that I am today. So I grew up in Northeast Ohio in a city of Elyria. My dad worked for Clorox. My mom was actually a lunch lady at an elementary school. So she loves kids, she loves food, put it all together. Um, I attended Elyria Public Schools from K through 12. I was in choir, concert marching band, student council, among other things. I participated in a gifted and talented education program uh, beginning in fourth grade, and I eventually graduated with honors as salutatorian of my class. Mm -hmm. I went on to attend the Ohio State University, earning two degrees from Ohio State, a bachelor's and a master's in consumer sciences. And public education provided me with a fantastic jump start to life and a foundation for success as an adult. And as my little boys begin their journey through school, I want to ensure that their generation has all the opportunities that I can possibly provide them to succeed academically and socially and to find their passions. So I've never held a political office before, um, but I've been really disappointed with how the state legislature has handled important issues like education, and I'm ready for that to change. So with my son Nicholas uh, being on the autism spectrum, he requires some additional academic and behavioral resources, and my other son, <laughs> his twin, Anthony, has been flagged early as being potentially gifted. So I understand the range of needs that students can have. I have a vested interest in public education in this state, and I know that you all do as well, or you wouldn't be here today. Um, so that's a huge reason why I'm running for State Senate. I am ready to work collaboratively at the State House with parents, with students, with teachers, with administrators to understand successes, opportunities, ideas for improvement so that we can create real progress and make sure we are equitably, equitably funding our schools. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> we'll take questions from the audience now. Who's going to be first? <laughs> Hi, my name is Sophia Ingor. I'm actually an intern for Mr. Lorenz. I'm going to be a journalism major. I read a lot recently about how there's supposed to be some legislation passed in certain states about teachers actually carrying handguns. Would you say that would be on the ballot for this education discussion? Are you asking one particular person or do you want to overall. respond overall? 
we'll just okay. We'll start here and go down. Well done. Love the this be the first one I'm supposed to Sorry. Next time we'll start down. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so um, I'm going to go for the first one. Okay. Um, I my general thinking on this is is that I have a gal down the street. I'm going to go for, she's an art teacher at Delaware City Schools, and she would, you know, she's such the model teacher. She was even up one of the ones on the pamphlet they were handing around when they were trying to raise a levy uh, last fall. And you know, she's the way. She, can you can you imagine me as an art teacher? with a, a block on my head, and I'm trying to finger paint. And as I understand and appreciate the argument that people make, that they think, well, there's so many, there's 300 million firearms in America. I want to carry one, too, to protect myself in the schools, because there's so many out there. But, and these horrifying shootings that keep traumatizing all of us. But I just have to think, and I think the insurance markets would say the same thing, that you're more likely to have tragedies happen, generally, as with kid teachers carrying guns and then an accident happens. So I think, I understand why people believe that, but I think that's not the best and most efficient solution to this problem. I would say, uh, Sophia, it's a great question. Thank you for raising it. Um, my mom was a teacher for 40 years, and the last thing I can imagine uh, is seeing my mother walk in with a concealed carry, and she's a Republican. Uh, so my stance on this is that our teachers have enough to do, especially with teaching to the test and some of the other things that are mandated by the state. Um, I'm a, I'm a Republican, and I uh, believe in the Second Amendment and the right to have a CCW. But I just feel like our teachers have so many other things to do. We need to look at other avenues to protect kids in schools. Uh, I've participated, when, and right after Sandy Hook happened, uh, participated on a, um, a panel here at the schools. Uh, so I've been looking at this for quite some time now. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's the right answer. Uh, at our school board meeting that we had the other night, we got a uh, excellent report on our safety plan, and I think that uh, the Olentangy residents and parents should be feeling very good about what their administration is doing to protect their kids. Sophia, thank you. Um, I believe present with you there actually is legislation that provides for teachers to have weapons in Ohio. Um, as a mother of two daughters, um, I'm one that would actually feel more comfortable knowing that there is a properly trained, and, and I want to stress properly trained educator. And I'm not saying that this is information that is made public, meaning that we don't know which teachers would be the ones who are caring either. Um, also, another idea I heard was that I think in one school district they have where um, there's a weapon so that someone isn't just inserting themselves into a situation that there may be places maintained within the school that only a few people know about where this weapon exists. I hate that this is a reality. I don't want anyone's room, uh, child in this room, uh, nor would I want mine to be sitting up in a school. Um, this is the current situation, unfortunately. And I want to know that when my kids are there, that um, there's not just, you know, especially one school resource officer who has to get to a certain part of, these are, these are big schools. And I want to know that there is somebody there. These teachers are amazing. And the fact that in Parkland, for instance, these teachers will, will jump in front of a gun and save our children, it's, it's incredible. So I feel more comfortable knowing that those people exist in the schools and that they're willing to be found on the street. Thank you. Denise is absolutely right. I mean, here in Ohio, I'd like to think this question has already been settled because there is a law in place currently that allows permissive it gives permissive authority to local school districts to decide on their own whether or not they want to arm faculty members come up with a program on their own. Um, some districts have already made a move to do this. Uh, just to name a few, uh, Sydney up in northwest Ohio, Indian Valley, New Covers Town, Coshocton, Riverview, and East Guernsey. Uh, 
so you know, they have made, for whatever reason, they, they have made the decision to arm faculty members, maybe the teachers, maybe their custodians, maybe their administrative personnel. I simply don't know. Um, but I think that speaks to, I think that's the essence of local control, and that's what we, I think, we ultimately want to strive for in any education policies to make those decisions at the local level. Now, I'm in the Westville School District. We have a very robust uh, school resource program in place with Westerville. My general township police officers are in Westerville schools. It's working out great. I see absolutely no need to arm faculty members in my district. I would probably say the same for Wontangy, but I can't speak for Wontangy. Those other districts, you know, they might not have a uh, local police force to draw from to have SROs. So you know, maybe they have to be a little bit more resourceful and, and take matters into their own, own hands, so to speak. Uh, there is a bill pending to define SROs that is not defined in Ohio Vice Code. The purpose of doing that will be to um, not only have uh, a frame of reference, then you can add grant funding to something once you define it, but also to create specialized training for SROs. We haven't defined what that training is or should be. And I, and I understand that that's one of the problems I have down in Florida with Parkland was that school resource officer who didn't, didn't intervene uh, perhaps didn't have the level of training that should be applied to school resource officers. So special, specialized training that should apply. That's what we're going to try to strive for here in Ohio. But um, I'm, I'm all for school districts making the decisions on their own. I don't begrudge other districts from doing it. They don't tell us our business and we don't tell them theirs. I do not believe that teachers should have guns, especially in high schools. How many of these teachers are smaller than the students? Those students could attack the teachers and take the guns away. This is a reactionary type of, of thing to do. I do not believe that that is the way we should go. We really need to do more analysis. Um, the politicians so far have not even tried to get the national gun death research done. That is something that needs to be done. Uh, the CDC has been denied the opportunity to do that research. Before we go off, and I realize that any time we could have another shooting, but reactionary is not the way to go. As Rick said, having the police work hand in hand with the school districts as a stopgap measure would probably be the best way to go, but we have to look at it long term. And long term also means that we need to have the funding. And also looking at the funding, we need to have our politicians start looking at common sense budgets. We have a lot of people that are, we're going to all have to um, give. We all benefit in some way, shape, or form. A lot of companies benefit in some way, shape, or form. We're going to have to all start giving back to the state so that we can get these, this money to fund all of the things that we need to do. Thank you. Um, I believe, you know, some of our most precious commodities are our children. I don't believe we can continue to be reactionary. We must be preventative in this aspect. Um, Denise, as a prosecutor, was able to carry a weapon and her job as a prosecutor. Uh, I represent two school districts in a village in northern Ohio as that, in that role, I can carry a weapon. Um, I liken this comparison. I'm also in court every day where some of the worst criminals in America are. Little, if ever, do we see mass shootings at courthouses because there is security at the front door and there are several people who are equipped with weapons. So, I would first wish to fund, um, increase funding for security and new security secure measures in our school buildings. Uh, I think that should be first looked at as uh, I would echo, there is current legislation that allows that. One of the districts I represent has had teachers carrying for almost 10 years. Um, and so it's been preventative for them. They, their teachers undergo strict, strict mental health assessments and very strict um, training and handling the firearm. There are select teachers who do that. Uh, I believe it has worked for them. 
Uh, I do believe, like we saw in Georgia, there was a teacher who uh, accidentally fired their weapon, or maybe on purpose, I'm not sure of the facts, uh, but that could be an issue as well, so I think it needs to be more closely looked at it. I do believe we need to equip uh, teachers, uh, certain select teachers. I do believe that this district, uh, Olin Tangy and other districts in our county, uh, should equip teachers because as we've seen uh, these tragedies uh, are everywhere they're not a wealthy district problem they're not a district and poverty problem they're everywhere and we need to pre be preventative and protecting our precious commodities of children um, I do not believe that teachers should be carrying guns inside of our schools I think it is too high of a risk there is too high of a risk of accidents. Um, there's too high of a risk of these weapons being stolen. There, there just should not be guns in schools. And I, I heard the argument. Um, we also have to look at this from a resource perspective as well. Who's going to pay for these? Who's going to pay for the training? Who's going to pay for the guns? Um, we should be arming our teachers with the resources they need to get at the root causes of these problems and not and like Kathleen was saying, not just be reactionary about this. We need to arm our teachers and our school systems with the proper professionals to help with student health, with mental health, to again, get at root causes. This also is not just an issue in schools. The gun issues are everywhere. We need to, as legislatures, look at gun deaths and study it as a whole. So I am not um, in favor of arming our teachers. I would be more scared to send my children to school knowing that the teachers had guns than sending them just with increased security measures. Yeah. Okay, another question? Okay. Come on, I know you have questions. One back here. Yes. Um, I will start with Rick Carfania because you talked a lot about STEM. What is your position and Everybody can answer this on funding the arts and where does that go in the school budget? Gosh. Um, again, I mean, I, well, look, I, I support the arts. Uh, I formerly sat on Valley Meds Advocacy Committee. I was co chair of Valley Meds Advocacy Committee for many years. Uh, I, I appreciate the arts, uh, the role of the arts in our school schools. Um, I think those are decisions, again, I think they need to be made locally, but I think that they need to be supported. Uh, you talk about STEM, yeah, there's been a movement to incorporate the arts into STEM as STEAM. Um, Otterbein has a really good program up at the point uh, that deals, I believe, with STEAM. Uh, it, it needs to be a prior priority. Um, I, I think we need to fuel the, the type of creativity and innovation that goes and, and, and leads to other other innovations in our economy. And that, that arises from that right brain thinking from, from the arts. So uh, I support it. Uh, I, I would hope that uh, other taxpayers would, would agree with me as well. Want to go that direction, Kathleen? Oh, me? Yep. We'll go down there. As a former student in Akron Public Schools who uh, took violin and piano and was in choir, Absolutely, the arts are needed. I believe that the arts help people uh, to learn more technology. You may think I'm crazy about that, but uh, that's, that's where I, you need to have some sort of logic. And I would definitely say that the arts have a place in our schools and they need to be back in the schools. Thank you. Uh, I didn't grow up with my natural parents and went to 30 different schools in my K-12 experience. Um, I am a product of public education more so than anyone could probably say having been to many different schools. And one of the greatest values I found in that were the arts. Uh, I fully support funding arts. I fully support keeping arts in schools. Uh, so not only uh, as a product of public education who benefited from music, strings, art, uh, I think that kept me involved and engaged and performing at a high academic level. And I see that also play out with my daughters who are in the strings programs uh, at the elementary level. And uh, so I definitely value uh, public education. I value what the arts bring to the table in public education. I would agree with 
agree as well. We need to be funding the arts um, in our schools. I don't think there's, I don't have a good kind of explanation, like absolutely it should be funded because of X, it just needs to be funded. I remember uh, when I was in middle school, one of my best teachers I ever had, her name was Miss Smith, a very generic name, but <laughs> <laughs> she used to do this thing. It was she was my music teacher, and she would like almost like poke you when we were singing. And I was kind of a shy singer. I wasn't the greatest singer in the world, <coughs> but she convinced me, almost made me sing uh, Joshua. Uh, fought the Battle of Jericho at a singing competition at Clyde High School. <laughs> and while I never became a singer, all those skills I learned, the confidence that I learned to be able to stand up in front of people and sing, to express myself, to be a guy in high school who plays sports who can also sing his heart out in front of a bunch of parents and his peers, that holistic education is what we need to be talking about. It's not STEM, it's not arts, it's a holistic approach to building better people. Yeah, I mean definitely a big supporter of arts in the school. One of my uh, triplets are at, uh, is at performing at a choir concert right now at, at the uh, Liberty Middle School, so obviously what I see out of the arts is an opportunity for an alternative way to connect with these kids uh, to give them self-value self-worth to help them learn uh, maybe you're making another connection you know already there's two of us up here that talk about autism and I'm sure we'll talk about special needs later on uh, but to make a connection to a kid that learns a different way uh, is super important and a lot of times you'll see our programs and music programs. Uh, it, it brings those kids together and includes them into the classroom. It's another opportunity to have full inclusion, which helps them develop social skills. So that's kind of how I look at it. But I do agree, it, it, you know, it's another roadmap or an opportunity for all kids to uh, get more out of their school opportunity. I agree with Rick, though. Uh, you know, I support it, but it's got to be driven on the local level. Thank you. Um. The reality is we're not all STEM people. I am not a STEM person. Um, I was a, I, I would like to say I was a mediocre clarinet player. I wasn't, but uh, I played clarinet and I was an English major. Um, Mrs. Fiddler, my uh, junior and senior AP English teacher, uh, really started a love affair for me with books. Um, I, I read all the time and I read whatever I can. Um, I do about 14, get about 14 books in a year. Um, so we're not all that person uh, that, that wants to do math in some of these other classes. Um, I'm that mother who made her kids at least participate for some time in the orchestra program. We have a beautiful orchestra program in the Delaware City Schools. So do I believe in uh, funding uh, the arts programs? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we're not all that STEM person and we, and we don't want to be. So that, that's my position. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Based on all of this conversation that we just had, and do I have to stand up? <laughs> um, someone mentioned earlier that um, there was a 3%, um, what was it, three, every three years you're going to have a, 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 a levy, and um, that there was going to be, that there's basically a negative 1% you know, going into the school systems. If you're going to fund, for those of you who want guns in schools and want to arm teachers and buy guns and you know buy security systems or metal detectors and stuff, how are you going to fund that? and the arts, what's going to be more important? Do you want to ask that to somebody in particular? The people who wanted, who were for having oh. guns and all that in school and then also wanted to Do have the arts. Start? Sure. Um, I actually think to fund higher security measures as well as potentially um, equipping teachers with weapons should be a bond issue from the state. I know that's passed down to local tax holders, but um, I don't think that should be pushed to local districts, but the state themselves, because I think it's a statewide problem. I don't think it's a local problem. Um, so to supplement a local district's budget in terms of training and assessing teachers, uh, I think should be a statewide funding issue, either funded by uh, 
money that is um, gathered from sales tax or a special issue uh, that otherwise uh, would fund those because I do think it's a statewide problem. Uh, I also think that in terms of, um, I don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul for those programs. Uh, so in terms of being preventative for the safety as well as, as uh, continuing supporting arts uh, and schools is definitely a competing interest. Uh, but I think the state funding or equipping teachers is a statewide problem. Uh, it was Rick. I think it was Again, I, I think the districts need to determine that on their own. I'm not here to, to say that we should be arming teachers or that we should not be arming teachers. Um, and I also don't know that we need to be pitting, making decisions between security systems versus the arts versus technology versus you know, transportation needs. Um, one of the things that we're talking about at the state level would be, and, and I, I want to be very non-committal about this because I'm not sure how the economic situation will look, would be to fund a grant to allow for the training of school resource officers. Again, like I said, it's a very specialized type of training that needs to be um, uh, employed uh, for, for these uses. So uh, if, if, if a school or if a district wants to start a school resource officer program, Maybe we could give them the funding at the state level through a grant to get them over that one-time pump. Then it would be on the district to fund that on an ongoing basis. I wouldn't want to see it as a this or that issue, and I would certainly uh, fight to provide for both of them our schools. Um, as Rick said, you know, perhaps through a grant, but um, I would like to find think that we would find a way through compromise and through working together. This is an important issue. Um, and keeping our students safe, so I'd like to think that we would work towards getting resolution on it. But I understand your concern. Um, you know, it's certainly something I would, I would fight for both. You want to? Yeah, I do, because I was the one who addressed the levy every three years in, in my opening statement. And I would say this is a fundamental problem of pitting this against that because because of the caps, okay? and, and we're not gonna fix anything until we fix these caps and state funding at, at, uh, for our schools. And that opens up more money for you know, other opportunities. Uh, I too agree with looking at a grant opportunity to uh, you know, fund special resource officers. But again, you know, like I said, I use my mom as an example. I, I could never see my mom carrying a gun. I don't into a classroom as a teacher. I don't want teachers to feel obligated to do that. So I, I look at it a different way. And uh, you know, I would certainly look at exploring a grant opportunity to fund our security systems here. We already have a line item budgeted each year in, in the school district for security methods. So I just wanted to pitch that in. I hope that, that makes sense. I, I, my, my comment is that the overreaching cap needs to be fixed. And then we'll have trickle down on the rest of those items. All right, you threw it out there, yeah. Brian. I want everyone's opinion on the state school funding formula. You want me to go first? <laughs> I, I, I mean, will. <laughs> Corey had to go first many times. Um, I, it needs fixed. I talked about it. It's something that I'm committed to working on. I, I believe that the House Education Committee has a potential of 10 spots open for the 1920 year. I would like to be on that uh, commission when I get elected to this position. I will work to reduce the caps. And we're getting, you know, like 29% of the money we should be getting because we're growing. It's so disproportional. Delaware's getting 67%. And I've met with Paul up there, the Delaware superintendent. I met with Buckeye Valley. They're in a good spot, but they're going to grow after us, and then they're going to have issues. So I'm not in favor. I want to fix them. I wanted to make a comment about that, though. As an urban planner, many of you guys that know me um, know that I do planning and zoning for a, for a career. Uh, and in my time with the city of Powell, some of the things that we've been doing uh, to try and mitigate growth is looking at our comprehensive land use plans. And what that is, is that's a guiding document that says how a community wants to grow. We've taken an opportunity to retool that document to 
refrain or scale down some of the densities that are in you know residential growth areas I know Liberty Township's doing something similar and they're in that process right now and I don't know Joel might be able to I don't want to put him on the spot but I know that Orange Township has recently gone through a program as well so put that in there thank you um, wow, you know, that, that is, uh, the school funding formula is just incredibly complex, and, and you know that, um, to, to me, how they pull those numbers out, I, I don't understand it. Um, so I think that one of the things I would do as the state representative of the 67th district is I would fight to, to work towards uh, fair funding for schools. We need consistency, and that's what property tax is provided, but we have to get away from just property tax. So I will work with, um, you know, I know Andrew Breyer has been very involved in this uh, issue, and I will work with any of the elected officials. Um, I will work with our school boards to make sure that what we're doing and what we're proposing makes sense. And then looking at also at any numbers that the LSC would give us. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an incredibly complex formula, and, and we need to fully fund our schools. Overhauling the school funding formula is a monumental task. I think what is more realistic, at least that applies to Olentangy, is fair funding. That's making sure that the per pupil funding that Olentangy is getting matches at least what the private schools are getting. And when you look at, when you add up the administrative funding and the auxiliary funding that private schools get, you're getting about 1,300 a head. <coughs> Olentangy is getting half of that per pupil head. 600, give or take, give or take. Um, that was my number one ask in this operating budget. Um, I lobbied our finance chairman about it. Uh, I lobbied uh, the speaker and our leadership team about it. And actually, in the previous biennium, before I was a legislator, Andy Brenner actually got it all the way through, got it onto the governor's desk. Governor Kasich vetoed that provision. So we've gotten fair funding all the way through, and it's been vetoed. Um, you know, back then, we were in a better place economically in this state. We were able to add another $850 million in additional school funding aid back for fiscal years 15 to 17. It was a much different story this past year. Um, Governor Casey came in and took a meat axe to uh, a lot of traditional public school fund, excuse me, funding. We had to go in and restore as many school districts as we could. Um, many of them we got back to zero or we got them a little bit of an increase. Uh, it, it's you know, nothing that I'm terribly proud of, but I'm, uh, I'm committed to working on unfair funding. That was uh, something that Andy and I teamed up with to do an amendment to the budget. We're trying to get it in. The political will is there. The money simply wasn't. We were facing um, a shortfall at least in projected uh, revenues by 700 million at that time now the picture is getting a little bit more more rosier I'm very confident that when it comes around next year we're, we're gonna fight for it again and then we'll get it I'm part of a school funding work group that uh, Bob Cup has put me on state represent Bob Cup I'm working on the technology aspect of it let's find out how much technology uh, it needs to be in, in available to each and every student and we're gonna apply that all to to the overall base cost but one of the recommendations that has been offered is fair funding and also let's uncouple the charter school funding from the traditional public schools. Uh, so that way you disconnect and you don't have these two, two entities that are kind of pitted against each other uh, so much. So if we can go to a more direct funding model for charter schools and move it away from the traditional school model, I think we'll all be much better. I agree there should be fair funding. But I also agree that we should not be using our public funds for private schools. I think that one of the problems that we've had uh, with uh, the schools, schools losing a lot of funds is that uh, there were a number of charter schools set up. And when I was younger, many years ago, if you went to a private school, you had to pay for it yourself. Otherwise, you fight for your public schools and you fight to get the funding for it. That's all I say. Uh, I do think that programs are this and that issue. I mean, let's face it, districts are not bottomless pits when it comes to money. School boards have to make very important decisions and choose which programs to keep, which programs to cut, because uh, they're not properly funded or fair funded uh, like here in Olman I think one of the major issues that Rick commented on is we need to stop this flow through money uh, to charter schools uh, where districts or public school districts are held accountable uh, for tracking students who go to charter schools and that flow through money that follows them to charter schools because it leaves districts in a deficit 
when that money follows the student um, to a charter school. I would support phasing out caps. I think that hurts uh, districts and taxpayers like we have in Delaware County. Um, I also think we need to hold charter schools accountable like public schools are held accountable with elected boards of education and finding a way to let them worry about levies and fund themselves rather than um, flow through money through districts. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, I do support the highest and best value model uh, with inside millage following that highest and best value. Thank you. Obviously the funding formula here in Ohio was ruled unconstitutional back in the 90s and we have not fixed that yet. So long term, we need to determine the actual cost of educating each child and create a fair, equitable funding model based on that and stop band-aiding it. Um, we also, as some of my other colleagues have said, need to stop sending money out of the public school budgets to for-profit charters, private schools. We should not be funding those types of things on the backs of our public education systems. We just should not. Um, and then taking a look at those cap formulas and understanding if districts are growing, that needs to be accommodated for. You can't just keep the money stagnant and expect them to continue to take in schools of children, children and not have anywhere to put them and not have the resources to educate them. So. I fundamentally think that the growth caps are unjust and wrong way to fund public education. In my mind, it punishes communities and towns for being desirable places to live, where people want to move. People want to, my wife and I moved to Delaware because it was, they got the sign. It's one of the greatest places to raise a family up from the, uh, northern Ohio. And that is barricaded by this system of growth caps for public education. And so we were asked this question the last time we all got together, would you vote for a budget that had growth caps? And I would not vote for a budget that had growth caps. There's a book I read to my daughter, and it has a little line in it. It says, you know, look at things from a different point of view, turn things upside down if it suits you. And that is what we need to do with the funding model of public education. We have 60% of the land in the state that is not taxed according to its highest and best use. This costs Delaware County alone 300 million. Uh, and this, so there is a tax base out there, a broad tax base that we are not using that we can go to and change this whole system and turn it upside down. This is for all the candidates. Um, House Bill 102. Does that solve our school funding problem? Or does it just take the decisions away from folks in only Yankee to best finance our schools and send it silent to the formal? House Bill 12. Is that Brenner's? Yes. yes. Yep. 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 Start down there, that thing. Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions about funding. No, House Bill 102, I do not believe, solves the problem. And I, from what I have read on this bill, um, I do believe that it attempts to take the control away from the voters and from the taxpayers of the district. So in this plan, House Bill 102, that has been proposed, um, it actually gives charters the same money a school district would receive, uh, except online schools, which would receive 30% less, which I don't know that 30% less is necessarily a solid percentage since they don't actually have brick and mortar schools. So, um, but, it's just, it's just an example of a way to kind of take the control away from, like I said, the voters and put it in the hands of a bureaucracy, a bureaucrat that's appointed every so many years with the government. So, thank you. If I understand House Bill 102 correctly, um, it would eliminate a local property tax and fund schools, I think on a sales tax, I might be wrong about that, or a statewide property tax. Um, but it also provides the opportunity for open enrollment. Uh, so I think as you mentioned, without that money going to Columbus, what keeps me from building a house uh, or buying a house for $25,000 somewhere and sending my kids up the road uh, to Olentangy? Uh, so it eliminates districts essentially. Uh, it eliminates, um, I think what the uh, uh, candidate down the way said, 
in terms of making a place a desirable place to live. Uh, so I do not support House Bill 102. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, and I think there has to be a better solution um, than taking uh, what was said just a minute ago, local control away from local districts. I apologize. I do not know House Bill 102. I'll be <laughs> <laughs> um, So House Bill 102, my understanding of it is, is it would be kind of a statewide sales tax as well as a statewide property tax. It would probably, uh, well, it would uh, alleviate much of our local property tax part. Um I likely don't support it, and I'll be honest, I'm not on the committee that's been hearing testimony, so I can't really comment on the guts of the bill. Um, look, I, I believe school funding probably needs to be a ratio of state share and local share. Again, I, I believe in local control. And I know that districts, um, you know, to whatever extent they can personalize, customize their curriculums, add specialized programs, depending on where they're at. You know, Northwest Ohio, they've got some great ag tech programs. We're incorporating into some of the local districts, and uh, different regions of the state are doing different things locally, and I think you need to have uh, the flexibility uh, to, to vote on those things and to you know, hold, our, hold our local school boards accountable by uh, having the power of the purse. So um, I do think that 102 is probably provoking a good discussion about what are some different ways that we can change our school funding model. I mean, if, if maybe we need to shift to maybe partially going to a sales tax or you know, doing it in different ways, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. But what has been presented, I don't, if, if you had to ask me today, am I a yes or no, I'm probably going to go on. As it stands right now, I would be a no on one of two. Um, I also believe in local control. Um, I also am not in agreement of doing one of the districts. So I would be a no. Um, uh, uh, similar as uh, my colleagues here, uh, it eliminates the local control. I, again, I'll stand by it. The, the, the main thing that we need to do to fix funding here in Olentangy is to get a reduction or get closer on the caps. Um, this House bill, I'm not sure how, I, I'll take a look at it another way. I'm not sure what it would do to, uh, how it would affect the way we fund our cities and villages and their operational budgets as well. So we may be doing something good for this, for this for the overall state, but that may uh, devalue uh, our hometowns also. So I believe it's important that we have local control. So what I think that House Bill 102 shows you, Colton, as a Democrat, a liberal Democrat, and then Andy Brenner, a conservative Republican, there is more common ground among us than we think there is. Because while I don't agree with the particular proposal, I think the sales tax statewide is a terrible idea to fund schools because the second you have a recession, your revenue is going to go down and then they're going to be firing teachers saying you don't have money for teachers, this and that. But it is the right idea to get to the state to be the funder and the appropriator for money, for money for the schools and for the local school districts, the local administrators, superintendents to stop having to be fundraisers and be administrators and educators. So it's on, it is on the, it's got the right idea but the, the uh, form of it, the reliance on the sales tax, and the money shouldn't go, it should go and stay with the public schools. It shouldn't follow a student to a private ECOT school where they don't have to go to and all that. So I give uh, Representative Brenner a lot of credit for thinking outside the box, trying to do, solve this problem. He, he missed the mark, but I think it shows that we can make progress. So it seems like the Republicans have controlled the Ohio Assembly for quite a while now, and the this formula seems like just ridiculous. Um, I mean, just explain to me, like I was a 12-year-old, why private schools get more money than public schools. I just I would love to know the answer to that, just a simple explanation, and I'd like to know why Republicans, why we should vote for a Republican. I would love to know that. I'll start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
as a Republican um, and someone who evaluated uh, campaign contributions. Years ago, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, legislation was passed creating charter schools. The Thomas P. Fordham Institute came to town and single-handedly influenced every uh, Republican office holder to change public policy in Ohio. Not only did they take somebody from outside the state and their influence, who Thomas P. Fordham Institute is heavily pro-charter school. Current legislators took $2.2 million from ECOT owner Bill Auger. So there is your problem, is that we have the fox guarding the hen house. And that, for example, Andy Brenner took $27,000 from Bill Auger. He's the highest, most esteemed supporter of charter schools and especially ECOT. But $2.2 million, so that answer your question on a very elementary level of why we have the problem. Because we have office holders accepting campaign contributions and making promises in turn, and it needs to stop. I would support legislation that prevents uh, any office holder from accepting campaign contributions from any private institute that would impact uh, school funding, for example, or school policy. We'll go down to you and then we'll come back to the board. Okay. I thought she was asking the Republicans. No, I would love to hear from you, oh. too, but, um, I, but I'm just stunned at why anyone would vote for a Republican in the Ohio Assembly right now. <laughs> Don't vote for a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm with you. I don't understand why our public dollars would be going to either for-profit charters, which education should not be something that you are looking to make a buck off of, just plain and simple. ECOT ran away with $80 million of our taxpayer right. funds, and those children, unfortunately, got nothing to show for it. In terms of the <coughs> private schools, I don't want to be funding religious schools. I don't want to be funding parochial schools. If I wanted to send my children there, I would. And those you know, institutions maybe should have some scholarship programs if I needed help with that. But I don't believe that my tax dollars or your tax dollars should be forced to go to those private institutions. They should stay in the public schools. So, you know, to be in all fairness, let's get Consider the, the Republican moral philosophy on the issue is that you know they they support small government. So and if you have resources in your community, growing communities, the idea might be, well, we're, the state's not going to give you money. So you have to go to your own tax, local taxpayers and, and ask for a bond issue every year or ask for a levy every year, and that's their that's the philosophy. Or you know they believe that you know. Public schools should have to compete with private schools. And if children are shopping between school districts like they shop at Toys R Us, then everyone will be better off. And that's their philosophy, and that's fine. And that's we can have this debate and come together and figure out with mutual respect how we should go about doing it. And that is why they would say to vote for a Republican. I, as a Democrat, say let's consider public schools something more essential, something more integral to the community than shopping at uh, Walmart versus Kmart or uh, something akin where you just have to rely on the magic of the marketplace to create a valuable service. I think Joel touched on it a little bit. I'll take it a little bit differently. You know, it's a matter of special interests. And uh, you take somebody like me who's only gotten money from pretty much tax payers and, and constituents and not special interest groups. There's a big battle that's waging its way through the Republican Party down at the State House uh, for the next Speaker of the House. And you've got two uh, different factions that are interested in controlling the House. People have joked to me. And they said, you know, Brian, you're kind of the man in the middle. You know, you're not, uh, you're the you're the man without the country. And I'm not involved in any of those uh, discussions, or I haven't picked a side, or I haven't been solicited. So I guess what I'm saying is you need people that are open-minded, and there are some of them out there. And so when I go back about this man without a country, I do have a country. It's all of you, the representatives here in the 67th District. 
I'll be honest with you, I can't explain it. I am not a career politician. I have not been down in Columbus to know why this existed. But I will tell you this, that as your representative, I will be accountable to you. And you know, um, I'm gonna be accessible to you. You call me and, uh, and, and you know, we'll meet. Um, I, I, am, I will be responsible to this, the district, of uh, you know, the 67th district, and not some special interest group, bottom line. Do you believe private schools should get more money than public schools? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Here's the thing: they're not getting more than, than public schools are. All Tangi doesn't it doesn't start out with six hundred dollars per pupil. It started with six thousand dollars per pupil. That's what the state has determined should be the base cost for for every student in the state. The problem is that that six thousand is fed then into a formula that drives down the amount. It filters it down, and then it goes through the, the caps, and that drives it down. And then you take away you know, open enrollments, um, you know, autism, special needs scholarships, ESC, career tech, and it just dwindles that money even down all the way down to $600. So I, I think it's a bit of a misnomer to say that they're getting less. They're not. They're starting out much higher. They're starting out at 6000 It just gets filtered down all the way, and there's a variety of factors that go into it. I mean, the, the wealth of this district. There's different, and, and, and I can't list all the, all the variables that go into the formula, but that's why it is the way it is. Now, as for school choice, I firmly believe in school choice. I think that any education model that is going to resonate with a child, inspire that child to learn, needs to be available to that child. I don't care if it's traditional public schools, I don't care if it's parochial schools, I don't care if it's charter schools, which are technically public schools. Um, I don't care if it's um, online schools, I don't care if it's homeschool. Whatever is going to best inspire that child to learn, I think needs to be on the table for that child. I'm a product of Catholic school. I send my daughter to Catholic schools, but I firmly support Westerville schools. I think they're excellent. I support them with my, with my tax dollars. I, I volunteer on the levy. My wife worked for them. I think they do a great job. I have made the decision to send my daughter to St. Paul's. I'm spending thousands of dollars of my own personal money to make that sacrifice, just like my parents did for me. And I don't ask for anything in return except for a bus ride home one, one way, and that's coming home. So Westville School District loves me because I'm giving them six thousand seven hundred excuse me, seven thousand dollars of my property tax dollars and I'm not taking anything back beyond a bus ride one way. So I make no apologies for for some support going to private schools out of our tax dollars. Okay, let's get back to the question. We're talking about Republicans and Democrats. Now there are some good Democrats, there are some bad Democrats, there are some good Republicans and there are some bad Republicans. Unfortunately, in the past few years, we have seen a lot more ultra-conservative Republicans taking charge of everything. And hopefully, we can meet in the middle. And one more, one more thing, the, the person who asked me about HB 102, I did a quick check. I wasn't <laughs> checking my email. <laughs> okay. And uh, the Marietta Times says, HB 102 proposes that dollars no longer go to local school districts, but to individual students. If that isn't going to charter schools, I don't know what does, so I'm opposed to it. Thank you. Somebody else have a question? I saw a hand Yeah, Back to the, uh, the great point about pinning, pinning the dollars on the backpack of the child. Um, I am a taxpayer here in Owens Tangy, and uh, my kids went through Owens Tangy for eight years, but I also send them to Catholic High School now. So I pay the taxes, approximately $9,800 a year, and I ask for nothing in return, and I pay tuition. Um, I'm interested, one, to hear what your, what your thoughts are on taking that allocation that we, that we uh, allocate to each child's education and pinning it on their backpack, that 6000 that 5000 that 4000 so they say, I send my kid to a Catholic school, I get help with the Catholic school because I am paying tax dollars that are just going into a general fund. And the second point I, I'd like to ask, and I think Rick, you're probably the only one because you deal with it legislatively, the administrative costs that are allocated for uh, Catholic school kids, and, and this isn't the ECOT or any of that, it is administrative, it's buses, books, and that's all based on legislation that originated, I believe, and hopefully Julie could help too, 1920, 1930, that every child has a right to go to school, 
arrive to school and get books for school. And I think that's the origin of that administrative cost. And also that the Catholic schools have to, have to take attendance as mandated by state law. So that helps them to offset their cost. Hey, take away the mandates to the Catholic schools and you get more money. But anyhow, that's, that's another argument. But I'm interested to hear all of your, all of your ideas on that. Start with uh, somebody who hasn't started. Denise, I'm, I'm sorry. Would you just paraphrase your question for me? Yeah. Uh, pinning, pinning the state dollars that taxpayers pay on each student's backpack. So if you choose to send your kid to uh, uh, a special needs school, that allotment goes with that child. Not the full, but that allotment. Or if they choose to send them to a Catholic school or a, a private village academy type school. You know, I, I, and I hope this answers your question. You know, I believe that parents are in the best position to make decisions on where their kids go to school. What I am saying, I guess, and what my position is, that is that if we're going to give this much money to a private school, we need to give at least the same amount to a public school. So I'm okay with that, but we just have to treat them equally and fairly. Anything else? Uh, I don't know if I'm there yet, to be, to be very honest. I believe in school choice, and you know, we allow for vouchers to go to kids that are in failing public school districts. Um, I would much rather see more money going to those kids that are in the failing districts that are economically needy than to a household like mine. I mean, I'm spending 400, excuse me, 4,000 plus to send my daughter to school. I'm doing that of my own free will. I'm not looking for a tax break. Would it be nice? Sure, it would be nice but I'm, I'm not prepared to to do that I, I, I think when it comes to school choice I would much rather see those dollars flow to um, the children that are economically disadvantaged to try to get them into you know the, the same same types of schools that I'm able to send my daughter to so I'm I'm not there yet sorry okay having um, as a child so long ago um, my parents, rather not my parents, my grandmother, my mother, I was raised in an all-female uh, household. And that was a very unusual thing at the time. And uh, kindergarten, public school, because it was just down the street. But because we were raised Catholic, I was sent to a Catholic school for the first three years. My family paid for that. There was no money gotten from the public schools. After three years in the Catholic school, they couldn't afford it any longer, so I went back to the public schools. I do not believe that any private school should get funding from our public education system. Uh, right, so you touched on a major problem with our current funding model. Right now we have this flow through money. A student is assigned in their home district where they live. Then that district is responsible for accounting for that student and verifying that student's enrollment at the charter school. So take Columbus Public, for example. They might receive, and I'm using arbitrary numbers, $6,000 per student uh, from the state. Um, but on a theory or theoretical number. But the state may actually only send them $3,000 per student and those numbers are way off. But Columbus Public then has to send the entire $6,000 to the charter school. So we need to, I think somebody mentioned, stop pitting charter private schools against public schools because that flow through money is killing districts. I think Olin Tangi maybe has 16 students that go to charter schools. Well, only 16 with the ECAT, but there, I think there's a total of 34 or more than are charter schools. So even though Olin Tangi receives about $600 per student. They're sending thousands to these districts. So we need to stop the flow through. I do support parochial schools. I would like to say that uh, emphatically. Um, so this funding following students and pinning it on their backpack, something needs to fix that because this flow through money is not working. It's, it's, it's robbing districts um, because the state has decided to charge districts for students going to charter schools. And what a better model for private uh, companies to get rich. So uh, it should stop, and it should stop immediately. I'm gonna 
a firm believer that public education is really the great equalizer where everyone can learn, everyone can get an education, no matter how much money your parents make, what your race, ethnicity, anything like that is. You do have the choice to send your children to private schools, parochial schools, and that is your choice. But you understand the cost associated with that. And that's not up to the taxpayers to be funding, let's say, a Catholic school, which has a religious component to it, when there should be a separation of kind of that church and state piece. So I believe that we fund the public schools, the public schools where everybody can go and get that free education. If you would like to take, send your children elsewhere, you have that choice. But I don't believe we should be funding it. Well, I, what, what, what concerns, I think you make uh, an excellent question, and it's a great philosophical question for all of us to think about. What, what I think about when you ask that question is that you have, even right across from this building, lots of land that are valued as current agricultural use value when they have no crops on them, no intention of growing crops, but every intention of holding that land away from the public as long as they can until they can jack up the price as high as possible. Uh, and in, a, in essence, this system extracts the price of the back of the dollars on your student's backpack. And then it takes from the public school with these higher land prices. And then also it charges higher rent essentially to the private school. So we have this system where we don't equitably tax all of our land, and that means that we want to pit the public school student against the private school student <coughs> when they're both suffering because of this inequitable taxation system. Um, I believe the uh, choice for a, a, a child to go to whatever school they want to go to, like Denise said, uh, is up to the parents. Those folks should be making the best decision for their children. They know what's best. I said it earlier today. I sent my kids to Oakstone for a while just because of the autism spectrum. And it, you know, we got the John Peterson scholarship and then the typical peers and whatnot. So I was in your boat. But I've got to say that the public schools, because we're funding them with public money, they should be held in the highest regard. I'm not 100% uh, against not um, cutting off the parochial schools. My wife went to Catholic high school. I went to a Catholic school for a couple of years. Um, so I think there's a value. What I would say though is, is here in Olentangy, and I mentioned this again earlier, you know, we really have the, the best system set up because we've got the STEM Academy. We have the access to the Delaware Career Center. Uh, we have the OASIS, we have the public school, we have the opportunity for these kids to go to uh, Columbus State. And so I think Bolantangi is a leader to other districts in the state on how you can do it, it, it you know, taking out the, the Catholic school, of course, but how you can do it holistically and keep it all in the district. Thanks. We'll take one more question. It sounds like you guys all support local control, but I'll just throw this out there. Can you really quick yes or no? But um, where do you stand on House Bill 512? Who hasn't gone first yet? I didn't quite hear the question. Oh, where is stand House Bill 12? 512. 512, yes. 512. 512. It gets rid of the, um, my understanding of it is that it gets rid of the. Um, State Board, State Board of Education, and there's the a person. Ohio Board of Regents. Under the governor. Yeah, yeah. Run everything. The governor's um, Office of Workforce Development, you would join them all together as one cabinet position and do away with the state superintendent. So you want to? Well, I'll go ahead and go. Well, that certainly sounds more like some cronyism trying to get somebody paid a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, yeah. no. <laughs> She's an easy act to follow. Uh, so, um, as a former educator, one of the greatest problems that just drove me mad was we would unpack standards, and six months later, the next General Assembly later, we're throwing those away and doing a new fad. Um, 
So let's put that in the, in the concept of maybe the chambers changing parties, the governor changing parties, and see how quickly those fads come and go. Uh, I do not support House Bill 512. I think it takes away local control and further um, puts our children for sale um, and puts us in a position that we will have zero say on curriculum uh, or any other model uh, that might be presented to our schools and for our students. So um, I think we need consistency and that will further uh, destroy that consistency. <laughs> <laughs> also not for House Bill 512. It's taking the accountability away again from the voters and from the taxpayers. You are putting it, basically consolidating it into one unelected official who can change every time the governor changes. We see how well this is all working out at the federal level right now with all the new cabinet appointees. So imagine if that was your Board of Education in the state. So I do not support that. I do not believe that that has the best interest of parents and students at heart. So, yeah. Before I uh, went back to the private sector, I, I worked as a, I was uh, an attorney with the Ohio Division of Securities and we prosecuted investment fraud in Ohio. And other states did it differently. We had a commissioner that's appointed by the uh, director who's been appointed by the governor and there's insulation of direct turnover. The state of Missouri, their division, was directly under the Secretary of State. The second that uh, the new Secretary of State uh, won election, he fired everybody. And so I had these cases in Missouri and I couldn't even work with anybody because they had no employees. And so I think that's the idea is that, you know, with, with that bill, this idea that they want the governor, you know, wants to have more power over the conversation and, uh, in education. I understand that, but my experience is that you need institutional stability in something as important as education. Somebody out there doesn't like our answers, I think. <laughs> um, I'll just be brief, but yeah, I'm not in favor of 512. I am in favor of small government, less intervention, but the bottom line. Again, it, it takes away local control. It's been set by several people here. It the opportunity for consistency. My concern with 512 is just more of stability. How do we create stability when there's going to be the possibility of turnover? And the last thing we need is us doing a knee-jerk reaction every time or putting someone in place, uh, someone new in place every few years. So I don't know what that exactly looks like. But based on the issue of stability, I would not be in favor of it. Well, I'm going to be the exception because I'm a co-sponsor of House. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> look, I, I, my approach is, is I'm troubled by, from a workforce perspective. Right now in this state, well, by 2020, 64% of jobs in Ohio is going to require post-secondary education. Currently, only 54% of Ohio adults have that level of education. We've got two-thirds of our eighth graders that are not proficient in math, 60% not proficient in science. 31% of our students are entering state public colleges having to take remedial courses. Um, the way I see it, I think there needs to be better synchronization across Higher Department of Education, Higher Department of Higher Education, and the Higher Department of Workforce Transformation. Um, it does not eliminate the state school board. It keeps it intact. You still have the same ratio of appointed members and elected members. You still retain your state superintendent. But what we're doing is we're going to, it's, it's a reorg. There's not a single change in education policy in 512. It's a reorganization. It's folding these three different agencies together under one umbrella. Um, and, and again, I, I think it's going to allow for better synchronization um, across, uh, across these three agencies. I mean, you've got graduation requirements that are not adequately syncing up with admission requirements to colleges. Uh, we don't have enough kids, I think, that are getting steered towards career tech. Um, we're, we're, we have a system in place that pushes kids towards our system of, of colleges and universities. And I don't think that's always the best route. I'm sorry. I, I, so I don't think that we're doing an adequate job of, of of, of trying to find, I, I think the goal should be to find personal fulfillment for our kids, starting pre-K all the way to the point where they enter into our workforce. And so I think folding them under the same umbrella works towards that end. Now, we're going to have to make changes to it, absolutely. I'm not saying that it's 100% great as of today, and there are going to be changes made to it. But um, again, we've got some very sobering statistics on the horizon 
with regards to our workforce. And uh, we need to be training kids and job skills for, for jobs that don't even, haven't even been invented yet. Uh, so that's, that's where I stand on it. I have no ax to grind with our agencies, with, with our superintendent, or with the, the, the Ohio uh, State School Board. Before you did, Julie, what he's done, and He's dying to ask the question. He's like, Spencer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but promise it's a, it's a Very short. short. Yes, yeah. we have a question. Um, so, Andrew Brenner, who's not here tonight, uh, and the only other sitting representative with Carfani, you've both taken money from uh, for-profit for charters. I have uh, not for, taken a single dime Andrew, from any charters. Andrew course. Brenner has taken uh, money from for-profit charters, and you took $5,000 from the Ohio Charter Communications Association. Uh, that's, no. not, that's not charter school. That's charter sure. communications. Yeah. Cable going, company. Going down the line, though, <laughs> will, you, charter school. will you or will you not take it? I, uh, I was also endorsed by the OEA. Right. But going down the line, would you or would you not take for profit charter money in your campaign donations? So we'll ask everybody that? Yeah. Can you commit to not taking Real charter quick. school money? We're making this quick. <laughs> I can definitely. Because they wouldn't come near me with a 10 wood pole. <laughs> uh, not only would I not take it, I would require uh, people who have taken that money to give it back because the state is owed $80 million and $2.2 .2 million of that should be given back. I don't think they'd give me any, nor would I take it. <laughs> Same. I haven't been approached, uh, so, but no. I, I have not been approached, and I don't believe that I would. I've not been approached either. Charter Communications is a cable company. It's now yeah. Spectrum. Yeah. That's what you're confusing. Yeah. I didn't take a single dime from ECOT, um, and I have no issues with ECOT personally. I mean, I, um, so I, I'm not actively soliciting money from any of our charter schools. Okay. Thanks for keeping it short. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight, everybody. Had a great time. Learned a lot about our campus. Thank you. You guys are great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.